Racing through the snow In a one horse open sleigh O'er the fields we go Laughing all the way Bells on pop Making spirits bright What fun it is to ride And sing a sleigh song tonight Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells Jingle all the way Oh, what fun it is to ride In a one horse open sleigh Jingle bells, jingle bells This may be one of the most awkward things that I've ever done, and that is preaching through an empty auditorium right now, but uh, I know that we are reaching into your home, and I pray that you are safe and warm this morning, and I'm just going to tap into my inner four-year-old because Cohen lately enjoys talking to his stuffed animals and his action figures, and so I'm just going to pretend that I'm just having a conversation uh, with, with people who are here, and uh, I have gotten a little bit of flack this week because last Sunday, if you were here or you listen to uh, last week's message, uh, one of our points was that our worship will be challenged and that oftentimes it's a very uh, well on a Sunday that we have inclement weather, weather when it comes our way. And uh, so I apologize. Uh, and actually, I don't. Uh, I just know that, that this is a challenge. And sometimes uh, when you're right, you're right. And so uh, we're just glad that you're able to tune in with us this morning, and we're going to continue in our series, uh, A Christmas at Greenville First. And so uh, we're going to be picking up uh, this week in the, the book of Matthew, and we're going to be uh, reading from Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 18 uh, and, and following. And it says this, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded and took Mary home as his wife. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you uh, for this season where we have the opportunity to just once again refocus our life and, and put you at the forefront. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to be born into this world to ultimately give his life for the sacrifice uh, for our sins. And so, God, we just pray as we take these next few moments and we look through Scripture, would you challenge our hearts? Would you open our minds, open our ears, open our eyes, even though today may not be a normal context for church service? Uh, we know that you are still with us and you are still speaking to us. So challenge us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, I can't help but think... Uh, for Joseph and Mary, this must have been a little bit of an interesting uh, exchange and an ex interesting moment uh, of their lives. And I can't help but uh, put myself into Joseph's shoes here and, and all of the thoughts and the overwhelming things that would be cycling through uh, his head at this, at this moment. Joseph is actually, I believe, where many of us uh, would actually put ourselves. It, it, it's, it's very easy to find ourselves in Joseph's shoes here. And I really believe Joseph is struggling with this thought of what will other people think. 
Now, to give a little bit of context here, um, because you may be wondering when it says in Scripture that they were engaged to be married, uh, and yet Mary was, was his wife, and, and he was going to have to divorce her. To give you a little context uh, into how things went during this time period is that engagements would actually last a year. Uh, and, and so oftentimes, uh, a husband and a wife would be paired, and then when they would reach their age, uh, they would become engaged. And so this would be uh, just a, a moment of, I guess, accountability or a moment where they would embrace that they were to be married and nobody's backing out. And they would actually be known as husband and wife. And so uh, the only way to escape once engagement was to begin was, was to divorce uh, the other. And so they're married, but they're not living together. They're not enjoying uh, the spoils of, of marriage, yet there's only one way out, and that was divorce. And so I'm just thinking through this process. Mary and Joseph, are, 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 they're, they're, they're engaged, they're together, they're labeled as, as a married couple, and now Mary has come to Joseph with this news. And, uh, and for many of us, it, it would be hard for us to, to really process and get beyond this moment. And, and I can just imagine they had some interesting household conversations. But Joseph here is struggling with this whole idea of what are other people going to think? What are other people going to look at, at our relationship? What are they going to think about Mary? What are they going to think about me? What is this going to do to my life for this future? Because during those times, uh, this would have marked Joseph and marked Mary for life. I mean, it, it, it could have challenged them, maybe not even getting hired. Uh, Joseph may would have, have, have faced no other father wanting to give his blessing for him to be married to, to their daughter if he leaves Mary. Um, but there's not really a, an explanation. They're together, and now Mary is with child. And so you can imagine how, how difficult this would affect every element of their life. And so Joseph is faced with this, with this major dilemma here. Am I going to choose what is right, or am I going to choose what is easy? And I think for a, a, a lot of us, we struggle with this, with this context of what does everybody think about the decisions I'm making in our life, or for, for my family, or for me personally. And so it's almost every day that we have to face these, these decisions. Am I going to choose what is right or am I going to choose what is easy? See, God here was asking a teenage couple just to be obedient. And their obedience would shape the future as we know it. And so this morning, the, kind of the question I want us to wrestle with and want us to dialogue through for these next few moments is how do we handle being obedient when circumstances are tough? Better yet, how do we handle obedience, period? Because I think that when we look at this, this task that is given to Joseph and to Mary both, and we're really going to focus on Joseph this morning, but all God was asking for was simple obedience. God didn't give them a 150-page instruction manual how things were going to flesh out from this moment. God was just asking for obedience. And we are always faced with this question of how will we respond and will we be obedient to what God's asking us to do? See, in culture, I think we, we, we face this. Are we going to choose what's easy? Or are we going to choose what's right? And so I just want us to kind of look at this story of, of Joseph and how he navigated and how he pressed through to do what God was asking him to do. And I think that there's some truth here as we explore what it looks like to be obedient. And number one is this, uh, and it's in your notes today that you can find in the app or if you're taking notes separately. But number one is this, pleasing God often means disappointing people. Pleasing God often means disappointing people. In our text, but after he had considered divorcing Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. The only fear element that Joseph was facing is what will other people think and how will they embrace me? And the truth of the matter is, Joseph is faced with this right versus easy, and right doesn't always please everybody around us. But we know that God had a great plan in store for them. And it continues on because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son and you will have to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I remember when I went to Southeastern University uh, 15, 16 years ago and, and I, I had gone to Southeastern just with this plan, my plan in place that I would go to Florida, I would, I would graduate in four or however many years it would take me to, to complete college, and, and I would leave Florida, and I would go, and I'd fulfill God's call for my life, 
somewhere other than Florida. But God had a different plan for our family. God had a different plan for my life. He had a different plan for Brittany and I as we were uh, uh, trying to just obey. And, uh, and it's interesting that oftentimes God's plan for our life doesn't look like our plan for our life. And so I, I, I really remember this, um, this tension in trying to navigate God, are you really speaking this to us? And so God was calling us to actually stay there in Florida and what would become a, a, a decade of ministry uh, there in Lakeland. But the right thing isn't always the easy thing. Here we were, you know, in our young 20s. We had never, never been married. We're graduating college. We're getting married. We're starting ministry together away from family, away from the comfort of, of both sides of family, away from the comfort of everything we've known our entire life. And I would love to tell you that, that this decision for us to, to be in Florida was welcomed by everybody, but it, it kind of created you know, a, a turn of events. That, that Not that we were disappointing people, but it may not have been people's plan for our life. It may not have been the, the choice decision that our families would have made, but it was the right decision. And it was the decision that we had to make and, and navigating through that. And I believe that God honors, when we begin to please God, when we're obedient to God, God honors all that. And it's not about pleasing people, it's really about pleasing God. Romans 8, 28 says this, and, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When we're following God's call for our life, when we're following God's purpose for our life, God's going to work everything for the good of us who love him. I, I wrote these two things down. Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. And the opposite rings true. Becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what people think about you. We are recently in a staff meeting, and we're going through a book as a, as a team right now. And one of our, one of our staff members uh, opened up and just began to share how, as we're growing on this journey together, that, that at, his, at his age, he's beginning to shift and realize who God's created him to be. And removing all the preconceived ideas of what everybody else may have thought or what he thinks other people may think about him and embracing what God thinks about him. And when we begin this exchange, when we become less concerned with what others think about us and we begin more concerned with what God thinks about us. Because God thinks the best about us. God sees the potential for us to get out of our, our mistakes and get out of our difficult circumstances. Why? Because he's calling us to a greater place. He's got a plan and a purpose in place for our life. And so when we begin to, to be consumed with what God thinks about us, all of a sudden we can put the other voices, the voices that will disappoint, the people that will always let down because we're not making the decisions they would want us to make, will always please God and God will work all of those things for his good and his purpose. Number two is this. I believe if you're not ready to be criticized for your, your obedience to God, you're not ready to be used by God. And I think that this is a difficult one for many of us to, to navigate because none of us enjoy criticism. We don't sit around and just love for people to, to speak against us or disagree with us. Um, but I really believe that we have to be ready for that if we're going to be used in the way that God intends for us to be used. You see, in, in verse 19 of, of, of Matthew 1, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So here Joseph is wrestling because he knows that there is going to be great criticism with other people by his obedience, by Mary's obedience, by fulfilling God's purpose uh, for their life. He knows that challenges are going to come. That's why he wants to divorce. Even if this is true, he wants to just separate part ways Take the easy route, but criticism's coming. Can you imagine the grief that Joseph and Mary would have endured in that moment? Because they stayed together. They, they chose to, to proceed forward. How, how, much, how, how many times they were, would have been scorned or gossiped against? Joseph's not really the father. She was pregnant before. All the things that you can imagine, and we would maybe even be guilty of thinking or saying ourselves, would have happened to Joseph and Mary in this moment. So if you're not ready to be criticized for your obedience, you're not ready to be used. See, I think of even most recently for Brittany and I, when we, uh, we knew God was stirring us to a new season. 
and we knew that God was calling us to do something. We just didn't know what that something was. And so we felt very clearly that God was calling us to resign our position and begin to, to trust him like we've never trusted him before. And we had some people in our lives that, that questioned whether we were making the right decision. They questioned whether we were headed in the right direction. Why? Because the way our life looked may not have been how they would have drawn it out. But in the same right, God surrounded us with people who encouraged us to stay faithful, encouraged us to continue to be obedient. And God had a perfect plan in place that he was orchestrating the entire time. But we had to choose to stay obedient. I know even now in your workplaces, in your schools, if you're a student, when you stand up for what's right, you'll be criticized. Why? Because the easy thing is not always or often the right thing. Many of us, we, we, we face this conflict, and, and the shame is, as Christians, we begin oftentimes to back down from the right thing because it, we just don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want to communicate the wrong thing. We don't, want to, we don't want to offend people. We don't want to receive the criticism that we may for standing up for, for things we believe in. Or maybe abstaining from things we feel like we need to abstain from. Or, or making different choices for our life. It's okay to be criticized because I believe that God will still use us in those moments. We don't have to, to, to hold up a sign and say, I'm against this. We can, we, we can begin to live our life. We, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Things, we, we should be known for the things we stand for, not for the things we stand against. And I believe that God will honor that. Doesn't mean that we're not going to be met with criticism. Doesn't mean that we're not going to be met with challenges. I believe that those that make the different, uh, biggest difference endure the greatest pain. I do believe that there's going to be great criticism, great difficulties for our life when we're pursuing what God wants for us. But I believe that we have the opportunity to make the biggest difference. Galatians 1.10, I, I, I love this, that, that Paul writes here, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's hard for us to be obedient to what God wants for our life and yet still please people. Our role in this life and on this earth is not to please people, but it's to stay in God's will. And I believe God will give us the opportunity to love people through our obedience I believe that God will give us the opportunity to lead people through our obedience, but we'll still face challenges. We aren't in this for the approval of man, but to stay in the will of God. And number three is this, is that I believe extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts of obedience. Extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts of obedience. When you really step back to think about this, the Savior of the universe... The one who gave his life so that you and I don't have to be separated from God. It was put in the obedience of two teenagers who just chose to say yes. Mary and Joseph would have been in their teenage years. Um, many think that Joseph may have been a little older and Mary would have been a little younger. Regardless, God entrusted in the life of two teenagers. Two teenagers, the, the, the hope of the world. The future for you and I, the, the reality that we don't, have to, we don't have to burn sacrifices, Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice, and it was because two teenagers chose to be obedient. Almost every one of us would have said no. Not I, why don't you pass? But God saw in these two something incredible. And they didn't know the details. I think for many of us, at least when I look at my own life, when it comes to obedience, I I like to know what all I'm saying yes to. Hey, let's sit down. Let's talk through this before I give you my commitment. Because I don't want to commit to something that I can't hold up my end of the bargain. Or maybe that when we really get into the details of this, we disagree. Or things don't look the way that I, I, I would choose. Or I would write it up. But they didn't have to embrace the details. They didn't have to know everything. All they had to do was say a simple yes. I don't believe that you and I have to understand completely what God's calling us to, to say yes. I believe that all it takes is an ordinary act of obedience, a simple moment of saying yes for God to do something great. Craig Rochelle says this, outcome is God's responsibility, but obedience is mine. Outcome is God's responsibility, but obedience is mine. You and I may have no idea what our obedience is setting into motion. 
I was sitting in my office just a couple of days ago, and uh, one, of our, one of our church members came and stopped by and just wanted to share some of the things that God was putting on his heart, things that, that I believe are going to set into motion some great things for our church. And I just began to hear as, as he was opening up and sharing the things that God was speaking into his life. And in this moment, it's just a conversation. But I believe it's just a simple act of obedience that's going to set into motion some great things that are going to take place. It's, it's in an area of need for our church. It's in an area that there is no leadership. There's nothing happening there right now. But it's a simple yes. Yeses can be scary moments for you and I. Because we actually have to move past maybe what God is revealing in our private to saying, hey, now it's time to bring something to the public. Now it's time to, to put some action. Mary and Joseph just, they didn't have an angel revealed to them and they just said, hey, we're just going to stay in a house for the rest of our life and not do anything with it. They actually went on the journey so that Jesus could be born and fulfill the prophecies that were set forth in motion years and years and years before they were even born. And so you and I, oftentimes we won't see now what our simple act of obedience will, will do, but I believe that it can bring extraordinary acts of God to our future. For some of us, that's just simply inviting somebody to church. Or maybe it's for us just to start serving in church. Or maybe it's just for us to start tithing in church. Regardless of what it may be, I believe that extraordinary acts of God are going to be paired with our ordinary acts of obedience. And see, I believe this, that above uh, the opinions of people, Joseph valued the opinion of God. And that's when he chose to do what was right over what's easy. And that's my simple challenge to all of you who are watching today. Will you begin to, to just pray, God, I want my life to do what's right, not what's easy. God, I want to be obedient. Brittany and I sat here the, the night that we were voted on as pastors, and we just said everything we will do will be in accordance to, to what God is speaking for our life. That commitment, I believe, for us and our home and our marriage and, and our ministry here at Greenville First has shaped already what God is wanting to do. Simple acts of obedience lead to extraordinary acts of God, and it's just when we choose to say yes to God, when we choose to value God's opinion over the opinion of others. We know that people are going to disagree with the decisions we make. We know that people will criticize decisions that, that we will make and, and directions we may go. But what I do believe is that when God is with us, who can stand against us? And that's the same for you at home, for us who are here. And we just want to stay in the will of God and continue to be obedient. Matthew 1, 24 says this. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. And he became obsessed with what God thinks about him and not what people. And that's the same thing I want you to to do today. Become obsessed with what God thinks about you. Become obsessed with what God is calling you to do. And the people, they may criticize, they may disagree, but God is calling us to do something great and let's do it together. Can we pray this morning? Father, we thank you just for your faithfulness. We thank you that you're calling each of us right where we are into the plan and the purpose that you have crafted for us as individuals, as families, as a church. And so God, I ask that you would speak to us clearly. Father, that you would give us the courage to choose what's right and not always what's easy. Father, sometimes those things may pair together, but many times we know that when we're obedient to your will, when we're doing what's right, we are going to face challenges. We're going to have to be determined and press forward, but you are going to give us the strength to do so. So guard our hearts, strengthen us today. In your name we pray. Amen.